Good morning, everybody. Uneducated economist here. So I got guest Mary Wingo. So Mary, please introduce yourself and kind of let our fans know, our viewers know what you're up to and uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, this is a, a total honor, uneducated economist. It's just, this is such an honor. I'm a big fan. And I think the uh, information that you dispense is extremely important um, for my fellow compatriots in, in the United States. I'm wanting to speak Spanish, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and I think that this conversation is very important. I think that um, there's going to be lots of information um, dispelled today. And wh wh what am I? Who am I? I'm originally from Texas. Um, I, uh, I got my PhD from the University of North Texas. Um, I found that really academic, well, I knew, God, decades ago, if this is going to date me, that the population was going to decline and the future of academics and this kind of um, career tra trajectory was going to be going nowhere, just like it's doing right now. And so I realized I needed to go into business for myself. And I realized that I needed, I didn't know it at the time, I was one of the first runners, Generation X. Um, digital nomad in 2008 and it took me years and years to build up but I finally uh, got to the point where I could actually leave the United States because I knew the writing was on the wall what is happening now I knew well it's been happening really for a long time but as they say it's kind of like a um, it's kind of like a frog being boiled in water um, if it was sudden we would notice it, but this slow grind um, to where the um, the bar, the standards are set in hell um, has been going on for a long time. And it took becoming a citizen. I'm, I'm actually a citizen. I'm actually Ecuadorian. I'm double nationality. It took being a citizen to really understand how tough life is in the U.S., okay? It is really tough. And let me tell you, the type of stuff that we native, um, well, natively born um, U.S. citizens go through would not be tolerated in, in theory, what we would consider much poor countries, poor countries. And I, I started studying this. It's like this is blowing my mind. What, what, Can you give us an example of what what one of these like? Just give us a small example of what you're referring to there. I'll like, give you. I'll give you lots of examples. Okay. Well, Number give us one, a good stuff. Give us some good ones. <laughs> Number one, public transportation. Public transportation. Um, if the oligarchies, like they did in the U.S. in the 1950s, you know, when they basically tore down the bus system and the train system in favor of uh, highways and cars. You know, th th those, were the, those were the fat cats, right? Well, if the, if the, the same thing happened here, um, the entire country, and I've seen it two times already, go into what's called a revolution or a paralyzation, where the indigenous, uh, and we're talking ancestral indigenous, we're talking people with their, their feathers and their ponchos and their you know, they're living like they've lived for the last 500 years or more, okay, they get out and they shut down all the roads and they, they shut down city hall and they don't, they just don't allow anything to, uh, to go through until uh, the authorities, whatever grievance uh, is addressed. And sometimes it can be addressed efficiently, sometimes not. But like for instance, we've got public transportation. Beautiful. I haven't had to have a car in almost nine years. Okay. And I don't need one. I'm like proud to not have one. Okay. Because you, you just don't need one. Even if you live way out in the country. I mean, it would be convenient. But even if you live way out in the country, the bus comes two or three times a day if you need to go to the market. Okay. Another thing is socialized medicine. Okay. Now, we have this crazy idea in our head that medicine has to be expensive. Um, no, it's because the oligarchs, the, the fat cats have taken over, just like every other sector of society, uh, the healthcare system. And, and I remember 
no, I remember as a college student realizing this. I mean, like, oh my God, things are getting worse and worse. And here, um, I remember that this is really funny. It's not really funny, but it's funny, um, kind of, sort of. It's interesting, funny. Okay. Nine years, eight years ago, I was just, there's a lot of pedestrians and there's a lot of crazy uh, Latin American drivers. And I was hit accidentally. Um, I was hit by a car and I didn't know what was going on. And I was knocked out. And I woke up with this, with like nine or 10 very sweet Ecuadorians. They're very sweet people. Just, are you okay? okay? And a policeman with my head in his like lap. I know that this isn't good medical practice, but they were like, it's okay. It's okay. We're getting you a, we're getting a, a, a an a, a ambulance. Ambulance came in three minutes. Okay. And they're like, where do you want to go? And I'm like, oh no. It's like, and I'm thinking like the United States. Oh my God. It, I don't know how messed up I am. I don't know how much this is going to cost. I'm like, uh, take me to the free hospital. Take me to the cheap. Okay, no problem. We'll take you there. So they took me there. And now it's rougher now, but it's still okay service. I mean, compared to a lot of hospitals, public hospitals in the U.S., it's still okay service. It's collapsed, but it's still okay. But then, back then, it's like they got me in and they sewed my head up and my leg up. And I was out of there in like 45 minutes. The police came and and they're like, oh, we're so sorry, you know, you know, so sorry, we're, we weren't able to catch the guy, but, you know, whatever we can do to help. And they were speaking English. I couldn't speak Spanish very well at the time. I was like, uh, I was very scared. And the young woman doctor, she's like, well, you're okay. You're going to be fine. You're not too messed up. You're a little bit messed up, but not like brain damaged or anything. And she actually walked me out. And because I looked like, I looked like, um, uh, Frankenstein I mean like ripped pants and blood or like the incredible hawk you know just bloody and you know just and no no uh taxi would pick me up I mean because I look so horrible blood everywhere and just torn clothes and everywhere and she hailed a taxi for me and I said how much does this cost I mean this is like like thousand better times better services than I could get in the U.S. oh it's nothing it's nothing what and it doesn't cause a, a country to go bankrupt. You know, it causes people to be in better um, public health, you know, so they can work better, they can function better. I mean, it's just stuff like that. Um, I can hitchhike here, okay? Now, no, like maybe in Quito and Guayaquil, now these are big, big cities, probably not. But like in the country, um, we haven't been able to hitchhike, I don't think, since. The boomer generation, the boomer generation in the 60s and 70s, maybe early 80s, the 50s, um, the greatest generation, the post-World War II, the soldiers would go and it would be your duty to pick up hitchhiking soldiers. No. Here you can hitchhike. Here you can hitchhike. And, and, and it's custom. And, and women and children and elderly hitchhike, okay? And it's custom to pay a couple dollars in gas and, you know, you have great conversations and stuff like that um it, it's no, don't get me wrong there's crap here don't, don't get me wrong but I realized I, I came to Ecuador in a very bad state of health um I had lost everything I'd lost my family I lost my business I lost my home you know like a lot of people tend to do okay I mean it's just you're going you're flying real high in the U.S. and then bam it can be gone. It happens. And in other countries, it's just not quite as unstable. I mean, you may not have near the cash, but then you have more stability. You've got more home ownership here. Okay. You've got less debt. I mean, yeah, you've got plenty of debt. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's screwed here. The, the, it's not just absolute paradise. But, and I realized, why is it so different? And my academic self, my scholarly self, you know, and, 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 and as I was uh, healing from terrible post-traumatic stress, now that I look at it, I didn't realize at the time, I was like, oh, my God, I'm one screwed up gringa. I started <laughs> traveling and hitchhiking throughout all the provinces. I've been to 22 out of 24 provinces, going way out in the country where not even the mestizos go. It's only the indigenous 
and I'd go way out and I'd, you know, in my real broken Spanish, it's good now, but my real broken Spanish, I'd start talking to the, the pueblos and they, you know, and I asked them, well, why are we so different? Well, it's because we do this and this and this. And why? It was because we've been here 14,000 years. <laughs> okay. We, we've been doing that the same. For, and there are tribes in the Amazon that the Spanish and the Incas could not conquer. So there are unconquered tribes. And I like, they're like talking to me. They're like, you know, they're accepting me. They're like, yeah, you know. And I started, there's like at least 14 nationalities here in Ecuador. It's called a plurinational country because it's really, they know that they couldn't just do one heavy handed centralization. So it's plurinational with control in Quito, in Quito, Ecuador. And so, yeah, I, and then you've got the decentralized food system. You don't have um, agro, agro industry like we do in the U.S. So you've got all these, yeah, just, just like old timey U.S., just like, you know, our great grandparents back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, they all have their farms and they sell their stuff to market. That, that's what we do here. We don't have, and this is by design. Okay, it's because people have resisted it. Um, we don't have big giant agro industry here. Um, we have all this decentralized. As a result, now you can see, um, I'm not exactly young, but you can see I look pretty good. This is the fantastic nutrition we have here in Ecuador. It's not made, I mean, you might have some nitrogen, you know, some, but a lot of it is organic uh, or very minimal. I mean, like, like they don't use Monsanto stuff um, uh, usually at all here as a result. And then along with that and along with being on the equator, along with uh, being along the Andes, you know, the Andes, big volcanic soil, just beautiful, the best farming, along with 5,000 year old ancestral methods, you know, of organic farming, of cultivation. We've got some of the best stuff in the world. We've got some of the best stuff in the world and so it reflects in the nutrition we've got fantastic water you can drink water from tap here it's some of the best water in south america and so yeah it's really and then on top of that now this, this is crazy we've got the jungle medicines we've got the shaman we've got mm -hmm. the ancestral medicine men and women um and this isn't just in the jungle but this is all, all throughout all throughout Ecuador, but in the jungle, we've got a particular, um, uh, we have a particular, it's ca called the Shuar Pueblo, and they're considered some of the best medicine physicians, you know, ancestral physicians in the world, at least in South America, and they've got knowledge of like 1,500 types of medicine that can do all kinds of crazy things, stuff we can knock out. Like, for instance, if you've got MRSA, if you've got, um, like, some sort of skin infection that won't go away, we've got medicines that will knock that thing out in two days. I mean, stuff that people die from, septic infections that, you know, they're just, you're given thousands of dollars worth of expensive pharmaceutical um, and antibiotics, antivirals. No, we've got medicines that will knock that out that cost almost nothing. Um, so it, it's this kind of stuff, and I started studying, and it's because um, Ecuador, I mean, people have been here, you've got uh, indigenous tribes intact, okay, unlike the United States, where it's pretty, pretty destroyed, pretty destroyed, yeah, but you've got, you know, indigenous uh, methods, uh, you've got uh, systems of justice, indigenous justice, I always love that. Um, indigenous justice, they don't kill people. You know, they don't put people in prison. You know, they give you public shaming and they may kick your ass. <laughs> but, you know, no, it's, it's never, whenever the indigenous protest or whenever they administer, it's never to loot, to riot, to steal, to rob, to kill. It's never with weapons. When they protest the government, it's never with weapons. They purposely, purposely, like we purposely are not going, they may have spears, <laughs> maybe some sticks if, if the police are coming. But I mean, as far as uh, guns, gas, 
um, uh, tear gas bombs. That's that's the government. Okay, that that's not the pueblos. And because of that, um, it's just you just don't have the poverty here. I mean, on paper it looks poor. On paper, we use the U.S. dollar here. On paper, wow, three thousand dollars a year, boy, you people are poor. Well, but when you look at it, um, they're not really. They, we don't have the homeless problem. We don't have people living in tent cities and in their cars. I almost became homeless through no fault of my own, just through bad luck. I mean, not that I'm irresponsible. I had a doctor, you know, very always a hard worker, and just things can happen in the U.S. And you can go from being up here to just collapsing and committing suicide. I mean, that's that's basically rags to riches, riches to rags. Okay, here um, we, we don't have homeless. We don't have hungry people. We've got people who are getting fat because this COVID crisis. Everyone's eating themselves, you know, nervous eating. But <laughs> as far as starvation. No, a lack of toilet paper. I mean, I've been like, oh my God, are we going to run out of toilet paper? I mean, I'm thinking, oh, revolution, Latin America. Oh my God, the poo is going to hit the fan. It's like, no, we never ran out of food despite the roads being closed. We never ran out of toilet paper. We never, uh, I mean, we ran out of uh, propane gas. But because we have hydroelectric energy, we've got subsidized electricity and people could use until the roads opened up again, their electric burners, you know, or their electric stoves. Most people use gas here. So really, and then if, if something happened, then there were churches, uh, organizations that can feed you three hots in a cot. We just don't. It, it, and when I tell Ecuadorians this, they don't believe me. They're thinking, no, you're the guys that are rich up there. You guys are it's like, no, man, <laughs> you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. So what what I'm doing here, and I totally I'm totally uneducated economist like you are. Um, I love I've been studying finance and economics, macroeconomics and microeconomics for 20 years, and so I come here. And what the problem we have here in Ecuador uh, after this um, COVID collapse, when everything closed down. All the money, so it's dollars. We don't have our own money. We have to depend on the United States for dollars to import every dollar. Well, when that happened, everybody took their money out. I mean, it's various various reasons, but you know, we couldn't export, you know, so we couldn't get income like that. Um, you know, people that had because we have very high interest rates on our CDs. It's insured CDs, like nine or ten percent. So there were a lot of foreign investors that would, you know get like nine or 10 percent on their uh, certificates of deposit here and then they got scared because you know Ecuador has had banking crises many 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 many, many money changes many uh, banking holidays so and I don't blame them people take their money out of the country or they if they're citizens they take it and they put it under their mattress just like the old times. and I'm thinking oh my god this is just like my grandmother's uh, in my great grandmother's world, this is like the 1930s. This is exactly like the 1930s. So everybody else in the world is going through very high inflation, if not hyperinflation. But here in Ecuador, with the same, I would say, nearly hyperinflated dollar, okay, that we have, it's deflated here. It's very bizarre. It's very bizarre. Okay. That that right there is probably pretty intriguing for most people. They don't understand that right there. Explain that a little bit if you can. Like, what is happening? You're using in Ecuador the U.S. dollar. And as we here in the United States are under the impression that dollar go bye-bye, it's like losing value. Nobody wants it. It's a hated item. But in Ecuador, it's not the same story, is it? No, no. I, I've tried to explain. It's like, guys, it's not that great. No, no, no. But see, this is what you get when you are the reserve currency. Okay. Because, I mean, I'm sure you understand by now, it, it, it's all, it's all a big scam. <laughs> you know, um, all of the uh, world money is in fiat status. And it's all just a bunch of, you know, oligarchs controlling, you know, and, and messing with our heads. And here we are, we're just working Joes, 
and we need to have some sort of medium of trade, right? And okay, what are you going to do? Use the Mexican peso? What are you going to do? Use the Chinese one. I mean, the China's in you know pretty terrible shape as well. Who, who are you going to use? What, what? Okay, well, I guess we don't have any other victim to use. We'll just use the dollar until it just we can't use it anymore. You know, until it's just you know until maybe they take it out of circulation and turn everything electronic, um, and then we are forced to you know change money again. Um, but yeah, um, because the dollar is so strong in the past, it has made um, Ecuador very expensive uh, compared to Peru and Colombia, even though we're basically the same, um, our exports. But now, now that the dollar itself is very inflated, it's very strange, and that we don't have these dollars, so we have deflation, our, our exports suddenly are very cheap and cheaper than China. So I'm thinking because I've been working in imports, exports, and on a very small basis for 14 years as a digital nomad, I'm thinking I would be a terrible citizen if I didn't try to set up an export, export program here in Ecuador. So I, I went to all my friends, my political friends. I'm friends with everybody here in Ecuador. I went to all my political friends and said, why can't we do this? Well, you, you know, and they're like, how do we do it? We have no idea how to do this. And, you know, we're isolated. We're isolated. And so, okay. So I started doing almost like doctorate level trade uh, finance, uh, trade mechanisms, you know, on a big level, not just a little level, but on a big level. And what is wrong? Well, what is wrong is you need, the banks need a lot of trade capital, okay, that it's called documentary uh, credit. So like when you have your uh, purchase order or your, um, or your invoice uh, and various other documents, you can present these uh, to the bank or to um, in, in investors that do this kind of business. And this is pretty much a secured type of a thing because you know you have to have documents from you know like for instance okay you know you have to have the purchase order you have to have the invoice you have to have uh various if it's agriculture you have to have um what do you call it certification you know inspections but okay so you have to have that you, you know you have to have all this stuff uh, maybe from you know um uh, entering like say the united states usda or sba you know you have to have all this stuff so basically, it's very low risk because, you know, you have all these documents that prove that the export is not a scam and the import is not a scam. And then they can offer advances, you know, and they get like two or three percent, one, two, three percent off of just lending money, maybe fifty thousand dollars or one hundred thousand dollars for, you know, like, for instance, wood, like teak wood, like teak wood, like you, like you do uh, in your, um, in your retail uh, facility, um, you know, 20, 20 containers, you know, of this. well, you need a bunch of cash for a short period of time. And this here in Ecuador, we don't have almost any of this, but in New York, we have this. And because I am an American citizen and I know how to talk to these people. Um, I got a lot of people excited, like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we would love to participate uh, with that, you know, as long as they can provide the documents. It's not important what country, what color they are, um, what uh, class they are, if they're small, if they're big, uh, if they can provide the documents, then we can provide the, um, the credit. So basically, I'm finding myself, I'm building infrastructure. For this country, I didn't realize. I'm, I'm very humble. I'm nobody. I'm not rich. I'm, I'm lower middle class. Um, but uh, I, I'm putting this all together uh, for the people here. And so, um, yeah, so I mean, yeah. let me, th let me this see is if what I can I'm kind doing. of break this. Yeah, let me see if I can kind of break this down a little bit for our audience to kind of understand why this dollar and the strengthening of it and how it's re how it's kind of reacting there in Ecuador. So ultimately, there's an exchange rate between because you obviously have a sovereign currency you're using as well, right? Not no, just the dollar. Just there's the no dollar. sovereign it's currency screwed. whatsoever. Just no, straight dollars. 
Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in order for Ecuador to even acquire these dollars to use, they have to be able to do some sort of trade, right? You have to export right. something in order to get those dollars back in. And so by those exports, you have actually facilitated this trade in a more efficient manner to try and like you were saying, to try and use the documents of like this trade, you know, we have, a, it is a, like documents of authenticity, so to speak, in order to prove that these are legitimate trades. And because of your knowledge and the people that you know in New York, you're able to acquire the credit that is needed to make these trades more efficient. With that brings in more dollars into Ecuador. Right. right. Okay. Right. So this is this is really what's happened here as far as like making it stronger. If there is less dollars coming into Ecuador, just like anywhere else, if there's less dollars in circulation, that means the strength of that currency within that in the borders of Ecuador would become stronger, right? Because there's Correct. less of right so Correct. in when you have in the issues of this deflation it's because of the demand for dollars that is outside of the united states that is then starting to increase strengthening the dollar you in turn are figuring out ways to get those dollars into ecuador providing more more stronger dollars into ecuador for the benefit right? So if I got all this right, I kind of kind of circle yeah. that around. Yeah, well, and, and, okay. yeah, I right. make sure I'm hearing your head. Right, <laughs> it's it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's something like, wow, this is really weird. I mean, I don't think I've ever read anything like this in history. I mean, I might be wrong, but um, I don't think I've ever read any. Yeah. So yeah, the dollar is very strong now. Now again, you still have the oligarch uh, oligarchs here, like they like say, for instance, that control the. Um, you know, we're, we're a petro state. We're very rich here. We're a petro state. So instead of being subsidized, they raised the price, you know, they controlled it and they raised the prices artificially. Okay. Even though demand is low and it's the same with the oligarchies, like for rice, you know, there's some, um, you know, some real big, big um, movers. Um, and so, yeah, okay. We're just going to raise our price <laughs> just because we want to, not because our own, uh, our own inputs have increased, but not because we can just take advantage of everybody else's. But apart from that artificial, if it's like, like for instance, if it's real estate, okay? Oh, real estate is taking a beat. You know I mean, if it's something that really depends on a true market, supply and demand, woo, adios. I mean, labor, everything, everything um, that depends on market, um, uh, supply and demand, demand, you know, has collapsed. Yeah. Yeah. How does um how does the home ownership because I heard you say that there's more home ownership there in Ecuador. How does that work? Um are people like buying property with debt or are they how does how does the property ownership and home ownership work there? Yeah, okay, now this, this is this is strange. Okay, well number 1. Okay, and and if I believe this to be the case, I believe I understand the law. Okay. Number 1. Okay, if you are a person with assets, okay? And usually it's land, land, because remember, this is very ancestral. So the land is in their blood, right? I mean, these are very, very serious to the earth people, okay? So, so basically, um, if you are a parent, and most people are, okay, automatically, your children are going to inherit your property. It's not like, oh, I'm going to cut this, you know, black sheep out, or I'm going to do this, or, you know, automatically, by law, okay? So there's no fighting, there's no, um, uh, you know, you know, and it's divided equally. It's divided equally. So there's no fighting, there's no people being left in poverty, you know, because maybe they were depending on their parents, maybe they were disabled, or they just couldn't find a job or whatever, didn't have the education. And so everybody get something from their parents, okay? Unlike the U.S. where a lot of us come out with nothing, you know, a lot of, I mean, literally, a lot of us have to spend money to support our parents, and, and it's just, it's causing lots of hardship. Um, that's what I had to do, um, and that's what my brother had to do. That's what a lot of people are having to do. So, yeah, so you come out with land, and um, people use cash a lot. Now, trust me, there's debt. Um, especially in the commercial sector, 
um, especially when buying commercial property. You know, you need to get that space. Or you need to rent that space in El Centro, you know, where all the traffic is. Okay, yeah, there's, there's debt. There's debt. Um, and there's more debt than there should be. OK, and the farms have got lots of debt because of the, the unstable nature you know, of the way agriculture is. But in general, people, because the banks don't have nearly the money to lend and it's much higher interest, it's like 20 percent interest. It's like credit card interest on maybe 15 percent interest. If you've got good credit score, if you want a mortgage you know, uh, it's expensive. Our car, you know, 10, 12, 15%. It's like a, you know, it's really expensive. So as a result, um, it's just like, it's called the flight. It's kind of like what the, our grandparents had in the 30s. It's called the flight to safety, a flight to quality and safety. So you spend money only on stuff that are very high quality, high quality clothing. Um, you know, if it's a used car, uh, used cars keep their about you know stuff something that would sell for 500 bucks like an old 1980 volkswagen rabbit would sell for 500 bucks in the u.s would sell for like three or four thousand here so the car can't be a junker you know if you're gonna sell it you gotta fix it up you gotta maybe paint it even though it's maybe a 1980 model maybe make sure the engine's right you know make sure you know you got lots of mechanics here you got lots of artisans mechanics so it's not a fault. So basically, you got all these old cars, and you got new cars too. Um, and you've got this land, you've got houses that are very well built. You know, they're built with cement. Um, they're not built uh, with, um, uh, you know, ply with like p particle board, like the U.S. has. They're built with cement. You know, maybe kind of ugly. It kind of looks third world a little bit, but it's not going to fall apart. You know, it's going to stay there. Okay, and so they tend to use higher quality you know we've got wood we've got all this stuff we've got all this i mean we're just so rich so we've got the supplies the stuff that would only a millionaire could afford in the u.s you know like wood like wood floors you know wood um and, and cement and stuff like that um it's, it's so cheap here and so you don't have rvs you don't have people living in rv we don't have rvs here if you're poor then you can do some sort of barter, work on a farm. You know, they pay three hots in the cot. You've got, again, lots of charities. It's not that expensive. I don't know what the big deal is. If someone falls on hard times, you know, why it's so important to just throw these people out. Because here in Ecuador, we don't, people don't accept that. I mean, if there are homeless people, if it, you know, like people from Venezuela, there are protests with the government. Do something, find a place for these people to stay, you know, do not keep them living on our streets, defecating in our, I mean, it's just a matter of priorities. So yeah, this is how the economy works. Um, it's not perfect. There's a lot of crap. Trust me, there is a bunch of crap all of us. Um, and, but I don't know. It, it's like Ecuador's been through so much. It, it was one, it's like Bolivia. Ecuador and Bolivia are very similar, very indigenous, have just been through so much crap. I mean, been through so much. I mean, just collapses, you know, uh, neoliberal control, you know, and just um, murder their president, you know, oh, the, you know, the typical, uh, you know, the shoot down the airplane, you know, I mean, all that stuff. Um, but one thing that's also different politically, you're going to love this, is that, and, and it works to our disadvantage as well, this is really bizarre, is you look at the political history and it's like, oh, God, they've been through so many constitutions. They've been through so many currencies. They've thrown out so many presidents. Very few presidents actually can complete their four-year term. I mean, it's the minority. Most of them, if he doesn't start performing, it's usually he. There's there only been one woman president, female president. But if they do not get their cojones in line and fix whatever problem they promised to fix, you start getting protests and, you know, get out of here. You need to quit. Maybe the, um, the Congress, we call it National Assembly, uh, might impeach you, throw you out. <laughs> and so if you're not functioning 
they throw you out. And it doesn't matter if you're president. They do this with assembly people. They do this with prefects. It's kind of like governors. They do this with um, alcaldes. Those are mayors. Mayors just want... They're always being, oh, you were caught, you know, getting bribes. We're going to throw you in jail off with his head. Not really off with his head. Well, and so, I absolutely love that. Um, <laughs> you know, great. I'm, I'm like, I'm the type of person. And, you know, a lot of times people like when they hear this, they think you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, bombs and pitchforks and all kinds of stuff. When I say that I'm more of an anarchist than anything, it sounds like Ecuador is too. Like, they're like, you know, we don't like this government done you know like you know, you're done you had it you had your 20 minutes to figure it out you're out mm -hmm. of here right you know and so um i love that like you know it's I really the it. people holding their government you know under their thumb i mean it was just like if you do not do what we are asking we're going to totally throw you over, you know throw you out um i absolutely totally appreciate that but one of the things that i'm kind of hearing when i was listening to you talk about the um the handing down a property to your family. That's a very interesting concept to think about. Um, so is there a way that you can sell your property off? Is there a way that foreigners can buy property? And then what happens if you don't have any kids? Oh, yeah. Um, now, uh, again, okay, if you don't have any kids, you need to have some sort of will, you know, give it to a foundation or, you know, or maybe your nieces or nephews or, you know, whatever, you know, that's, um, but yeah, uh, it, it's to, to answer your question, um, it, it, it well, when you're forced to hand your property to your kids, what it does, it's less, it guarantees that there's going to be less poverty. Okay. Because, you know, you're not just giving it all to one kid and we used to have big families. We don't, you know, it's Catholic, right? We don't have big families anymore, but you know, used to that seven, eight kids. And if you just give it to one kid and you leave the others, you know, hungry, you know, b before modern Ecuador, when it really was poor, when it really, truly was redneck, like Arkansas poor, uh, Kentucky, you know, redneck, um, hillbilly poor. Um, it, it, this was an important anti-poverty measure. OK, um, it made sure nobody would go hungry and nobody would be living in the streets. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's a real strict thing. It's a real strict thing. Um, well, um, the reason why I'm focusing in on that is because, uh, and I'm not trying to push back against anything by any means, but, mm -hmm. uh, Cantillon addresses this particular situation as far mm -hmm. as only a certain am amount of allotted land being divided up amongst the people. And then that, that land then being concentrated into the hands of just a few. So, what ends up happening, um, at least through Cantillon's theory, and this is one of the things that I was asking about because I just yeah. wanted to understand like what what this kind of situation would occur, or if there was an example of it. Um, so what he is basically saying is that say a gentleman has you know a family and has eight children, right, mm -hmm. and he has eight acres of land, he can leave each child one acre. Right. But then the next child, each one of those childs have eight children themselves and therefore only have an acre to split up amongst eight children, leaving the ever increasing amounts of less land. Then if there is a, another individual who has no children, who has eight acres of land, can he purchase that land from the other individuals and therefore begin to concentrate his land from the other individuals out there who have even less land. Do you see like the situation? Absolutely. That sure. Right. Sure. You can. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, there's everybody and their dog has their lands for sale because why they don't have any dollars, but I, I guess what it is, it's kind of like, sort of like the U S or how I remember Texas back in the eighties, you know, um, it, it's kind of like how the U.S. was sort of, I don't know, just it just kind of reminds me of kind of the old times. Kind of the yeah, old like a Wild West situation almost, like, you know, kind of go out there and it, tackle the land a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's ancestral. And, and the, the indigenous and the ethnic mestizo, you know, the, not the westernized, but the ethnic mestizos that have their own costumes and it, the, they're like, I don't know, they're like the absolute genius masters, okay, that 
I'm telling you, I mean, maybe if I'm smart one day, I can put together some sort of workshop and, and maybe get, you know, ag, ag students from Texas A&M University to study, to study. So, yeah, um, but yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, we've, uh, there's, everything's for sale here. And yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's another thing that I'm helping out, you know, people that like need to sell their farm. Um, it's just not profitable because there's no dollars, but they've got all the certifications. They've got all the infrastructure. They got the crops going. They've got all the, the talent in place, mm-hmm. ag talent, ag tech in place. Um, I, I help them sell that as well um, and try to get a fair price. I mean, everything, everything, what I'm trying to do is if people need to sell, okay, whether it's their products, their land, whatever, my intention is to just get fair prices, you know, not mm-hmm. allow some oligarch to just come in, okay, yeah, I'm going to buy for two cents, you know, and then these people are left bankrupt, um, struggling, you know, yeah, that, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So th- that is what I do, you know. I'm working with export, exports of all kinds, not to, just agriculture, but um, well, wood as well, because I've heard you talk about wood. Um, mm-hmm. I'm working with uh, artisan, artisan products. I mean, like, this is kind of cute, <laughs> I mean, yeah. but like textiles. I mean, we've got all kinds of stuff. Uh, and also, um, you know, uh, uh, factory items, because Ecuador is just, it's it's crazy. It's so independent. We make our own tires here. We make our own car parts, toilet paper. Um, I mean, you know, if it's not high tech, okay. I mean, if it doesn't re- require semiconductor chips or anything, you know, if it's old timey paint, you know, uh, tools, chemicals, you know, various chemicals, industrial chemicals that are made from the petroleum industry, plastic, we can be completely shut off. And except for the, you know, the, the high tech stuff, totally surviving. It, it, there were no, there's no shortages like we have in the United States. There's no, sh- this is what true wealth is. Mm-hmm. You may not have the money. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's, there's often, there's often a, a very common saying that everybody says, everybody, we're millionaires here in Ecuador, but we have money problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 well that's that's true i mean like well even um you know what is wealth you know food conveniences and pleasures of life and uh it exactly. sounds to me like you've got plenty of food and conveniences mm-hmm. pleasures of life is really just you know your opinion of things and what you're enjoying around you so yeah i could see where ecuador could be very a wealthy country when you look at it from that kind of standard um you know one of the things that i really kind of like that I really enjoy about this channel and some of the things that uh, that I try to bring forth for people who are watching this stuff is, you know, just kind of like the independence, which is something that I think that you have found within this, like, you know, kind of setting like, you know, being in Ecuador and all that other stuff aside, just personally, it sounds to me like you have really kind of like grasped life and said, okay, I'm going to do this for myself. I'm going to go off into Ecuador and I'm going to create the life that I truly wanted because I'm not finding it there in the United States. Um, one of the things, just kind of doing a brief research of like, you know, some of the videos, you talked a lot about stress. Let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how is it that as a, as an individual, Uh, like say, say, you know, and, you know, and maybe, um, maybe it might be a little, you know, shifting gears here, but say the individual who is listening to this and thinking, wow, man, that's a really inspiring thing that you have done, you know, to get down to Ecuador, to follow your dreams, to do these sort of things say I'm like, I'm just working my nine to five job and I'm lost right now. What is it like, you know, I'm, I can't, I'm having a hard time paying my bills. I'm having a hard time figuring out to get in relationships or whatever it is that I need to do, but I'm kind of stressed out here and I'm trying to figure things out. What sort of like motivation would you give them to try and inspire them to do kind of like what you have done, you know, to to, to grasp life and and become independent, you know? Okay. Um, This is a very serious subject for me. Okay, this is very, very serious because this was this is actually my specialization, human adaptation, you know, and this is one of the reasons why I'm here. I mean, this, this is I walk the walk, talk the talk. Um, I, I went back to the US. I went back to Texas to visit my friends and family. My, my father was in his last days and he passed away a couple months ago. 
And I've only been back to the U.S. two times in nine years, two times, okay? Very short period of time. And, and again, it was great to see everybody. I mean, really, it's great to see, you know, all, all my homies. But one thing um, that's very, very clear, it's very clear, and it's not just with my homies, it's with everybody, you know, it's with everybody. Um, and it's with the expats that you see here in Ecuador as well. It appears to me, especially since the COVID stuff, okay? But it's really been a long grind. It's that boiling water for the frog. You don't realize it's so bad until you get out and you, oh my God. I think a majority of the people in the U.S., uh, and probably in the world, but especially in the U.S. because COVID hit very hard there, okay? have some sort of PTSD, okay? I mean, maybe less, maybe more. Um, and, you know, when, when you have people, they, they can't move. I mean, I mean, this is basic animal instinct stuff. You know, people can't move. Um, they've got fear. The media, you know, is um, presenting 24 hours a day. We're going to die. We're going to die. We're going to die. All these people are dying, dying, dying. And then your job closed down, you have to shut your business down. Uh, maybe it's a business like, like a mom and pop uh, hardware store that's been there 50 years and they've been knocked out. So you can imagine, I mean, and it just goes on and on and on and on. And here in Ecuador, people actually ran out of money. We, we got no stimulus here. I mean, we, we got, we got hit there in the U S we got some stimulus kind of, sorta, you know, um, but what you're seeing, you know, all this great resignation stuff, all this is people, they're burned out. Okay. They're like, I was like, I was, they're burned out. And, um, it, it's like, w w what's the use? You know, I bust my ass, you know, I go into deep debt for my education, working, you know, my, my cojones off for nothing, you know, for you know, I don't have health care. I can't get my teeth cleaned. Um, I can't get medical checkups. Um, uh, I can't afford a home. You know, I'm professional. Maybe got a doctor. Maybe got a master's. Maybe an engineer. I, I've done all the things right. I mean, this is the typical American. I'm not a criminal. I study, you know, and the system's just not working. It's just not working. And, uh, you know, I can't trust that my job will be there in a year. Uh, I can't trust that if I put uh, what little capital I have, deflated capital I have in a business, that it's going to work. Um, you know, and it's just you. And it, I just think, um, God, and I hope people don't kill me for this. My impression, okay, and this is, this is Dallas, Texas. So in theory, everybody's coming to Texas, right? In theory, you know, they're coming from California and New York to Texas, right? Texas, Dallas looked abandoned to me. I mean, I was taking pictures of just an empty downtown on a Tuesday afternoon. And a lot of people, oh, this is difficult to say. Oh, it's kind of like it reminds me of the, the ex-Soviet Union, the Russians from the ex-Soviet mm -hmm. Union. It's like they've lost a lot of hope. Now, here in Ecuador, we've got the indigenous. And they always raise hell. When things go sideways, stop, stop, we raise hell. There's revolution. So you may not get all of what you want, but at least you're not, you know, um, spiraling into oblivion. In the U.S., we don't have this type of energy. We don't have the Pueblos anymore. We, uh, the, the Pueblos, we, we, it is mostly we, they, they, they've died, you know, um, for reasons we're not going to go into. We're not going to go into that. But we don't have this energy in the U.S. And just the grinding, grinding, grinding stress that people have. Um, it appears to me. We're going in the U.S. Okay, okay. Uh, this is going to cause a lot of... 
very severe depopulation, okay? And young people don't feel confident to form families and have kids. And another thing that I saw in Dallas, because it's big immigration, you know, we've got a lot of folks from um, Mexico, Central America, and a lot of folks from Africa, India, uh, Pakistan. A lot of these people said, it sucks here. I don't want to be here during this collapse of COVID. Me boy, I'm going back home, vamanos. And so I think that we really overestimated our growing population. We depended very heavily on um, on uh, foreigners. And you're seeing it with this. See, this is the reason I'm very happy I'm not a professor or, or depending on, you know, uh, university for my paycheck because it's the same thing with the university. Um, the student enrollment has collapsed. A lot of it is because it's, Foreigners, rich foreigners, just don't think it's worth sending their kids to the U.S. anymore. You, the U.S. is not, it's not the high-class place that it was perceived to be all this time, you know, in the past. Now it's like, God, it's just expensive. It's just expensive, and um, my kid doesn't have health insurance, and, you know, it's violent, and da 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 you know, all this bad press that we have. And so yeah. they're, they're not sending. The- Seems like it's uh, almost like the United States is losing a lot of its credibility. Oh, it's lost, uh, unfortunately. Lost. Right. That's yeah. what I guess I should say with the with yeah. the monks. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the only thing that I can do, um, and believe me, this has caused me trauma <laughs> to realize. <laughs> oh my God! You know, and it's kind of like you. You probably started realizing things, and everyone's just how can people just be walking around and not in a total panic mode? Well, I went through what you're going through. I went through that as well. And the only thing that I can do for my fellow Americans, I mean, I'm very humble. I'm, I'm, I'm really nobody, really, um, is sell you guys high-quality food with vitamins. You know, I mean, I, the food that we have in the U.S. is very poor quality. And at least I can get you stuff that, will improve your health so by eating it I, at least i can get you high quality stuff cheap you know uh, that that is what i can do is i can send you high high i can send you products with high nutrition value okay cheaply that's what i can do i can't do anything else i've gone through this morning this crying um this trauma I mean, it's taken me lots of ayahuasca, lots of jungle medicine to realize that I don't have a home to return to anymore. I don't really have a family much to return to anymore. If, if I, if the poop hits the fan, I need to figure it out here in Ecuador, which they know how, they, like I told you, they're the cosmic preppers. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you're out in the country and you're indigenous or you're an ethnic uh, mestizo here, we call them cholas, cholas and cholas. Yeah, you're broke and it sucks and it's demoralizing, um, but you're usually not hungry and you're not homeless and you're not freaking out where you're going to stay if you lose your right. job. Yeah. So we you got know, this kind um... of social security. Yeah. 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 There's, it's, there's a social security. You know, I like the. The idea of that, you know, it's just like you're secure in your social surroundings, you know. Um, right. You know, one of the things that I like about the idea and, you know, something that I'm kind of picking up from from what you're saying about, you know, being in Ecuador. Um, one of the things that people here are very um, adamant about and fearful of is the government and what it is that they're going to be able to provide or what it is that they are providing or something like that. If a lot of people are reliant on government, politicians and the political atmosphere and stuff like that. What I love about what you're saying is just like, no, that stuff really matters because we're going to overthrow it anyway. Um, you know, <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you, you go be dependent on your government and figure that out. We're going to, you know, whatever it is you figured out, we're going to throw, you know, we're going to throw it out here in a few months. Anyhow, that, that sort of pressure, that sort of pressure to put on your government is exactly the way this country was built. That's right. You know, and a lot of people don't realize it is that, the mindset of that of of what you have in Ecuador with that 
is very much the the presence of the forefathers of this country, which is completely lost right now. Yeah. I mean, people do not like the idea of overthrowing the government, like at all. Like nobody wants a revolution, right? Some people do, but like most people are like, no, it needs to be Republican or Democrat. That's what it needs to be. And yeah. nobody ever thinks about, no, we need to pitch this thing out and try it again with a much, you know, better establishment back to the original things that we had uh, had talked about inside of the Constitution. The chances of something like that are very slim considering the oh, size yeah. of this country is. But considering if you wanted that sort of like, you know, presence of mind and, you know, frame of life, Ecuador has it going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great place. And I will say, I mean, of course, I'm biased, but I've, I've visited quite a few Latin American countries and Ecuador is the best. And Bolivia is good, too. The very disobedient nations that everybody loves to hate on because they're so disobedient. Um, you know, they're, not, they're not cooperative. Civil disobedience. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they're, they're usually got the higher standard of, of life. I mean, you don't have the desperation. Now, in Peru, unfortunately, the forces have captured Peru and Colombia, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, and so it, you've got some really nice people, and it's still great places to live, better than the U.S., um, but it's not like Ecuador. Ecuador's just high class. It, it's just, it's like Switzerland. Uh, it's <laughs> no. safe. It's safe. Um, um, I, I was blind. I was actually disabled, blind, and I was able to travel all over this country. Nobody bothered me. Everybody protected me. Yeah, until recently, I'm, I can see now. But yeah, I, I just. This is a wonderful country, and it's given me hope in humanity again because I didn't really have that much. And unfortunately, um, based on history, I don't think that the U.S. has got a very good future. I think that, um, it, I mean, it, it, this is just speculation, but this is kind of basing it on history, basing it on science, uh, anthropology, sociology. Um, I, the U.S. is just going to... Basically, the birth rate is just going to continue cratering to nothing, and um, the boomers and the older Gen Xers are in terrible physical shape from, you know, very poor nutrition and, you know, not being able to, you know, afford stuff like cleaning your teeth and getting cavities out and, you know, doing preventative maintenance, like it's so cheap here in Ecuador to do, um, that it you're just going to see a decline, just like in the Soviet Union, a decline of life expectancy. Um, if it's not from just, you know, this, it's through suicide, through alcoholism, drug addiction, overdose, um, especially young men, um, especially middle-aged men, okay? We have to really care for men our age, okay? Uh, What's generation happening, yeah, yeah, because because this is the middle aged man, the one that man, man, I was making money, I was a was an investment banker on Wall Street, and then the system worked until it didn't. And what happened in the Soviet Union is, you know, the system worked for them. They had jobs, you know, then the bureaucracy, they were, and then the system didn't work, and a lot of them just committed suicide because they couldn't support their families. And yeah, uh, so I think that, I mean, this is, this is what I'm seeing. Um, nobody wants to admit this and I get in trouble when I bring it up. So I don't bring it up. You're not going to get in trouble for bringing up yeah. anything on my channel. <laughs> yeah. You can, you yeah. Have, yeah. Whatever you want to talk about, yeah. you talk about. Right? But, but <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, I don't see a future. I would say if you've got kids, train them in to be bilingual, trilingual, uh, to maybe so they can pursue a future in another country, you know? So Spanish and what other language? Well, of course, you know, um, well, again, I would think that, um, you know, looking at the most spoken languages, you know, like a Mandarin, um, Hindi, Arabic, probably statistically, I mean, it's all regional, right? It's all regional. But probably um, if, you're, if you want to stay in the Americas, Portuguese, French, Spanish, and English, if you want to stay in America. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to go back a little bit. What do you think is going on with the population decline? Why is that occurring? Because of stress. 
high is cortisol. Is alone? Yeah, high, high, high cortisol. Because humans or, or animals, animals, were not meant to be in this type of fear, okay? To be in this type of high tension. Okay, how the fight and flight and fawn and freeze reaction work. It's only supposed to be good, like, like it's only supposed to be used like when you have a bear chasing you, right? When the bear is gone, whew. but to go on like, am I gonna be homeless? Am I gonna, you know, am I gonna lose my job? Am I gonna, you know, lose my house that I've been paying 10 years on? I'm gonna lose all that. I mean, just this, this is not how animals, not just humans, animals are meant, especially mammals, are meant to function. You have your stress for a short period of time, you know, and then it's gone, and then you can just relax. You're not sitting. But what a lot of us have, we've got PTSD, okay? So what, what is PTSD? What, what, it is when the stress response goes from adaptive to maladaptive and it messes up the memory centers in your brain so the things that caused you the trauma repeat over and over those are the flashbacks okay those are the flashbacks and those flashbacks can be like visual like you can like remember like being stuck in vietnam with the bomb or they can be emotional so when you felt really hopeless and fearful you might shove it out of your mind. I'm not going to think about it. And then all of a sudden you're just eating soup and then you have a, a trigger moment. Okay. It's this. Okay. It's this that destroys the human. You know, I mean, when you hear about the soldiers from Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam, it's this that causes people to want to become alcoholic and drug addict because you are in so much pain and you're like thinking, I, I can't control myself. I'm going crazy. I can't. Con and so what do you want to do? You want to toke it up. You want to take, you go to the doctor. Maybe, maybe you're, you know, a Baptist, you're religious, and you don't believe in drugs. So you go to your doctor and, say, and, and he gives you the drugs, <laughs> the legal drugs, or she gives you. And you become addicted or, or you become addicted to opioids. You experience pain. And unless you can break out of it, um, well, usually people with PTSD, the statistics state, live 20 years less than the average. Yeah. So you're talking a bunch of people dying in their 50s, 40s, 50s, early 60s, you know, heart attacks, suicide, diabetes, you know, diabetes type 2 is also stress related because what is it? You're eating to comfort yourself. You're eating because, you know, you're in pain. You're eating sugary foods. I, I know I love chocolate. I love Ecuadorian chocolate. And I want to eat it all the time. If I'm nervous, oh, boy, it's comfort food. Okay? And then especially if you're eating the garbage food, you know, the, the, the toxic, uh, you know, uh, food, and you're eating that for comfort, that's just going to make your health go um, sideways even faster. Um, yeah. Um, it's very sad. And... Um, yeah, it's uh, it was a lot of emotion for me. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds all, like. It. Yeah, 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 and um, and it's difficult, you know, being a scholar in this and really understanding that there's really, unless there's huge change, there's really, if things are just going to continue, nothing's going to change, and basically, um, yeah, I remember, you know, someone mentioned in during the population decline in in Russia and Soviet bloc states. You never noticed how many people were missing until you went to family reunions or class reunion reunions, um, and like, oh my God, really, people are missing. Or, or like when you you know go through downtowns and they're all abandoned, or you go through a rural rural areas, you know, like various you know rural, and they're all abandoned, um, and you realize there's just nobody there. So yeah. yeah. So anyway, the best I can do is is I can sell high quality food and products. Um, I, can, I can get you your vitamins <laughs> and your nutrients and your minerals through Ecuadorian exports. That is the best I can do. I can serve world, mankind through that. Mm -hmm.
because you know, to, to, to get good food, especially tropical food, um, you know, stuff that's not readily, I mean, except in maybe Florida available, that's very high quality. It's, it's you know, it has your vitamin C and, you know, has, you know, magnesium, calcium, potassium. It, it's almost no. nothing. So that, you know, that's the only with. thing I can do to offer, you know. No, no. And it's, and that's in, you know, really the food that we, we take in, I mean, I don't think a lot of people realize because, you know, they like, well, I like, you know, whatever junk food, that's me personally. That's what I eat. A lot of people don't realize like how, how much it affects everything about you. Like you're saying, your stress levels, the way you, you know, your, just your mental well being and stuff. I know that I, like at one time in my life, I was really broke. Like I didn't have much income. I didn't have a whole lot going on, but I have a little, I had a little hobby farm yeah. going. Right. And so I would raise like my own food. I had raised my own chickens and I had a neighbor who was kind of the same mindset. And so between the two of us, we grew a lot of food and we would trade, you know? And so eating that homegrown food, I noticed there was two things. One, I didn't need to eat as much of it and I had way more energy, right? So like, I kind of realized that when I was eating the garbage food and what I basically mean by garbage food is all the commercial food you get from the grocery store, that I would have to eat a lot more of it and I just didn't feel very good from it. And also I noticed that when I left that hobby farm and went back to the commercial food, my not only my stress level, but then my depression levels also increased along with it as well. And so it wasn't just like a matter of like feeling good. If you don't feel good and you don't have the energies, then your depression levels start to kick up as well. So this food that we are eating just in general, like before any of the conditions of your life or anything else are going on, just the food itself has already put most people in a condition of depression and stress. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's really where a lot of a lot of people's problems are is just the consumption of the food that they are eating, regardless of the the political or economic environment that we're all in, mm -hmm. just the consumption of the food itself could change dramatically on the way we are living ourselves, you know, for ourselves, just by just by switching that up some, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> right. And that's really where I find like a lot of stuff is is starting to happen. I know for me, it was a big change. Like, I don't have the hobby farm now, but my wife has switched from going from like a commercial grocery store to a co-op mm -hmm. where the co-op has a lot more organic food, stuff that is grown closer to the location. So it's not exactly like going to the farmer, but it is a lot more healthy yeah. food. And yeah, again, my energy level started to increase and I didn't have to eat as much. Yeah. 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 And yeah, it's, but a lot of people, I mean, it, this is probably not cheap either right um i'm, I'm guessing it's, that it's not but luckily because she works there we get a little bit of a discount yeah. and you know she's also right there and sees the takes advantage of the sales that are happening at the time i mean obviously we still have to go back to the other commercial grocery store to get some of our stuff but right we try to eat as much as we can within the, the organic or close to the location as we can get you yeah. know and it, and it does make a huge difference yeah yeah, yeah. And, and that's great and and see what we have here, we, of course, we have the supermarkets, you know, kind of like Kroger's and the Walmarts and all, all that. We've we got some of that. But most of what we have is called Mercados. They're called Mercados. And it's just these big, big farmer's market. I mean, it's, you've got bus stops there. You've got buildings there. You've got people there that have been selling from their stand for 30, 40 years. I mean, it's generational, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a block and a half from my house, I can just go get stuff like with potatoes that still have the dirt on them where they were dug up that morning. Um, and it's cheap. It's cheap. It's more expensive as it should be to go to the places that are similar to Kroger and Walmart. But yeah, yeah. it's, but yeah, yeah. So, but those are subsidized in the U S so what you're, I guess what the real tragedy is, is well, thank God you guys can afford it. But how about people who are making minimum wage? How about people, single moms, dads, or retirees that are making, you know, $1,200 a month Social Security, and maybe they paid their house off. Maybe they did everything right, but they can't afford to live there because energy rates have doubled or tripled, and their property taxes, even though they're senior citizens, have doubled or tripled. And they literally, even though they've done everything right, they can't, they can't eat well. I mean, they, they can't live, you know? You're, yeah. So I just see more and more in this and, and I'm,
so happy you and your family uh, have the ability to do this. We have no, to I appreciate about, it. We, we, yeah. we have to think about the probably hundreds or hundred plus million people who you know live in food deserts. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's urban okay. or rural, um, who all they have is Walmart. There's nothing else. You're going to starve to death. If you don't eat that crap from Walmart, you will starve to death. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'm just, I, I, this is so foreign to me now. And this is also one of the reasons why I see just not a real bright future in general um, for the mm -hmm. U.S. I mean, you have the food, you've got the lack of hope for the youth, you've got the lack of hope for the, you know, people going into retirement, you know, am I going to be able to take care of myself? Um, and so this is a way, if you want to stress people out to where they'll start killing themselves indirectly or directly, um, yeah, just make them fear for their life through the media, take away their job, you know, take away mm -hmm. a, a future, you know, competent, politicians that can truly do, you know, uh, real economic policy instead of fake economic policy. And yeah, you've got a lot of people that just don't think life's worth living. You've got a lot of young men that uh, can't, you know, have mates, you know, can't get Let's married. talk about that a little bit. Yeah. What's going on with the young men? What's going on with the men in this country? Because that seems to be a growing thing that is discussed now. I mean, I was even reading an yeah. article about how 30% of what was it, men between, gosh, it was like the yeah. sexually active age too, or like 30% are virgins or haven't had a sexual partner in the last year. What's going yeah. on with the relationship it's, formation that's failing to, to occur? It's the same here in Ecuador. It's the same. It okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't have quite the, it's not at that level, but it's the same. It's the same here in Latin America. It's the same in Brazil and Colombia. Um, Venezuela, it, it, it's it's the same. It's just not as bad as it is with the westernized countries. But yeah, um, you know, whenever young people in general don't feel like nothing they can do is going to make any difference. Okay, this is when you start getting unabombers. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you start you start getting young men that um, are frustrated. You know, um, that they can't have a mate. They you can't marry. You got women who are frustrated that you know I want to marry, I want to have kids, but God, I would be irresponsible to bring you know bring kids in without support. You know, women need support um, in order to you know, and yeah. and we're not talking conscious. We're not talking conscious. We're talking this is something at the hypothalamic uh, brainstem level. Okay, so if you stress out a bunch of bunny rabbits or guinea pigs, okay, and, and they don't understand economy, they don't, but they understand lack of resource, okay, it's the same thing. Their fertility is going to collapse as well. So this, yeah, it's conscious, but it's an animal thing. And yeah, we're, we're just looking at depopulation. We're just looking at yeah. um, a lot of, yeah, so, that, that's just what yeah. we're looking at. I don't mean to like, you know, focus in on it, but I was just kind of curious on, I mean, yeah. so there's a definite change to society in, in the way that men are behaving. And I've noticed this, like, I didn't like, I, I, and it's not that I just noticed it just like throughout, like, you know, all my studies or whatever, it's something that I've really just kind of noticed after I started reading that article and that, you know, I remember growing up, like there was a lot of things that have been considered now toxic masculinity right? This toxic masculinity thing that seems to be what really has taken men from being like in this dominant role that I'm going to be a provider and a, you know, person of security and all this other stuff to saying, hey, don't do that anymore. What you're doing is like against what, you know, society is wanting you to do. And then now here they are lonely, depressed, unable to provide, women are wondering where like, you know, these strong independent men are that are going to, you know, be this, you know, provider. And I'm like, really like, to be honest with you, I am very naive when it comes to this subject, because I've been married since I was 18. I mean, my wife and I, we just like, you know, just been focusing on each other and never really thought about like what other people are going through. But, you know, here it is that there's definitely this occurrence that has taken place where there is this lack of, of like traditional roles creating a family formation and therefore like the lack of population that comes from it. 
do you see anything like going from that? Like there's just no drive out of men anymore. They just don't care or what? Well, I mean, you, you've got a couple things there. Number one, it's always economic. If a young yeah. man can go straight out of high school or trade school and just be rocking it and it's merit, uh, meritocratic, you know, where, okay, yeah, I just, you know, with that youthful enthusiasm, go in there and just, you know, rock it. Th that man's probably going to produce. It doesn't matter what kind of narrative of toxic ma masculinity, okay? That, that man is, you know, going to attract the women because the women, see, women, and, and again, women have their issues as well. But in order to reproduce, okay, and this is, again, this is not just conscious, but this is like brainstem, subconscious, basic, basic biological mechanism. If a woman feels supported, okay, and part of it is having a, a person, you know, that can, if, if they're not the, the bread maker, you know, they can at least like do the home really, really, really well, you know, I mean then if women don't feel supported subconsciously, okay, not even consciously, they're, they're not going to have babies. And, and it's not even a willful thing. It's not even an oopsie thing. It's like they're just like the young men, their sex drives are going to go down. Um, and if what sex they do have, they're just not going to be as fertile. Also, another thing, you probably read this, is the decline in fertility rate. Uh, a sperm counts for, for men has collapsed. Again, this is a lot of contamination. Uh, here in Ecuador, we don't have near the plastics. I mean, yeah, we can make the plastics because we're a petro Ecuador state or petro, Pec I'm sorry, I'm speaking Spanish, a petro state. Uh, but, but like in general, you know, stuff made as wood, um, you know, we don't have the plastic laminates in our floors, cabinets. Usually, I mean, usually it's wood or, um, uh, what do you call it? Ceramics. Um, so you don't have like the plastics from carpet or from, you know, um, yeah, we have a lot more plastics and a lot more just forever chemicals, that kind of thing. I'm not saying it's none. It, it's a lot in here and I have to avoid it myself, but you know, we've got a lot of more natural fibers, you know, you know, uh, wool um, and, um, you know, alpaca and, you know, various, uh, I'm not saying it's, a hundred percent. But I'm just saying that um, one of the reasons is all the chemicals. Okay, just just tons. And I would say if you um, are like a young man and you're scared of losing your masculinity hormonally, man, clean up your environment. You know, be careful of the products that you use uh, on yourself. Okay, the food that you eat. Um, you know be careful like if you can try to have natural like 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 wood products or you know ceramic products instead of plastic products I, it's hard to kind of put but limit your exposure to just all this crap okay and try to get back down to old old school old school living Right. And yeah. that's another important thing about the food that we're eating. Again, like the processed foods and stuff is probably killing the testosterone that's going, you know, that's yeah. that because this is a worldwide thing. This isn't just yeah. occurring and just like, right. I mean, this is worldwide. So it's 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 got to be like, you know, something that is occurring that everybody is doing together. Yeah. And it seems to me that the food is really it. Like there's really nothing else out there that really joins us the same, maybe the air we breathe or the water or something like yeah. that. But really the one thing that definitely is food. I mean, the processed food yeah. is probably one of the biggest reasons why we're seeing some of this stuff occurring or yeah. not even, Yeah. I mean, not even some of it, a lot of it, you yeah. know? So very interesting stuff. Mary, I love talking with you. You yes. have been just a wonderful yes. conversation today. Um, what else do we want to tell our guests? Anything that you wanted them to really know about, something that they should focus yes. in on, any message that you really want to get out to, to, to my viewers? Yes, girls? thank you so much. I, and, it's, and, and whenever you would like to discuss other topics, I'm, I'm totally here. Um, I just, I love this. There's very few people that can really have intelligent conversations, even academics. Um, that have uh, intelligent conversations about um, these topics, very serious topics. So 
but number one, I would like to introduce, my name is Dr. Mary Wingo. I'm here in Ecuador and um, I am director of Proyecto Minga. Um, Proyecto Minga is, a, is an organization here in Ecuador and it's also a 5013C in the United States. And um, I'm, I, would, uh, I would like to ask if it's possible um, in your YouTube, if you could drop a link uh, for GoFundMe, you know, because you know, wh whatever funds people can send so I can pay secretaries and you know, pay for travel costs to go see you know, the, the farms of the indigenous and to you know, uh, go to various uh, products, um, ex expositions. We've got tons of great products here. And, and if I could drop in a, a GoFundMe link and if um, whomever feels compelled, um, I know times are tight, but I've got very, very, very good products um, to sell the United States products that are needed to, it's very humble, but to as, as little as I can better the lives of my compatriots. Um, I know you guys are suffering and I'm so sorry. And um, I, I wish I could do more. I wish I could do more, um, but that, that's what I can offer. And um, I don't know, maybe one day I'll be president here in Ecuador. I'm not sure if I want to be president because they might throw me out and put me in jail. But um, but it would but be a I, fun 20 minutes, all right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, but no, I, I'm developing a more powerful form of leadership um, that's, I think, higher and more functional than the politics. I'm, you know, form of trade that the people can be included with, okay? So that, that's, that's all, that's all I have to say. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mary. Um, we will definitely put the links down in the description for everybody and whatever ad revenue that this video makes, I will donate to the GoFundMe. So okay. um, yeah, absolutely. So you'll get at least uh, some contribution from me for it. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. And thank you everybody who has uh, sat through the interview here. It was, we covered a lot of stuff and it was a great conversation. So uneducated economist, you guys let me know. A Brazil's fourth day. Ciao, ciao. <laughs>